So they did a plot analysis of the typical pornographic female fantasy. A innocent, well-meaning and attractive young woman encounters a male who's a bit of a monster. And the monster, there's five types of classic male monster. For all you males who want to know, this is what you can become. I was reading this book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts that was written by a bunch of engineers at Google and they were looking at billions of search, uh, billions of Google searches. And you know, there's no shortage of pornography on the internet. And, it, and there's much less by proportion than there was when the internet was first invented. And it's so interesting because it actually turned out that one of the things that drove the development of the internet and the technology was the proclivity of young men to search out sexually provocative images. That was what was at the forefront of the development of the net. It's extraordinarily interesting. They were motivated to they were motivated to use it for that purpose and that provided the platform from which it emerged. Amazing. Anyways, the Google engineers looked at pornographic search processes and then segregated male searches from female searches and what they found was that the male searched out images surprise surprise no one no one considers that you know particularly interesting but the females searched out literary representations of pornography it was written and so i can give you an example of that if you know about harlequin romances does everybody still know about those anybody not know about those okay well they're mass market romances and of, of a very stereotypical type and uh they're, the original ones were pretty harmless in, in terms of no violence and no real sexual contact, con content. But that was 40 years ago and they've differentiated tremendously and now there's hardcore Harlequin romances and with, with particularly garish covers and then there's the old, you know, more tame, basic sexless and aggressionless romances where everything is implied and not explicit, but the explicit ones exist. So they did a plot analysis of the typical pornographic female fantasy. Well, and it was so, it's so comical because engineers did this and social scientists would never do this because they'd be probably too concerned about the ethics of it or some damn thing. But engineers, you know, they'll just plow ahead with no concern whatsoever for such things. And they actually discover things that way. And so they, they discovered the basic plot of the female pornographic literary product. And they identified, so basically what happened was that a innocent, well-meaning and attractive young woman encounters a male who's a bit of a monster. And the monster, there's five types of classic male monster. For all you males who want to know, this is what you can become. Vampire, that's a good one. Werewolf, billionaire, pirate and surgeon. Okay, so that's very interesting because well, first of all, there's a dominance thing. There's a, now you're actually blushing, you know, you're actually blushing about that. That's very, very funny. So, <laughs> sorry to point it out, but it's so comical, you know. I know, I know, it's so funny. I, I, I was reading this, I was reading this, it was just cracking me up. I thought, oh my God, really? Pirate, vampire, oh, that explains it. What about all these damn vampire shows, right? They're so popular online. They're so popular on Netflix. Oh yes, and then there's the werewolf. There's nothing sexier than a werewolf, apparently. But I mean, so there's predatory, do there's predatory dominance that's implicit in that, right? With the billionaire, it's more abstract, but clearly that's an indication of very high success in the male dominance hierarchy. So, but there's this desire for aggression that's in that, a real aggression. Right, and it's not surprising to me, to me at all. It makes perfect sense. Um, but what, but the basic plot is that the woman encounters this mysterious and aggressive male and tames him. That's the female hero myth, as far as I can tell. It's Beauty and the Beast, and so it's because well, there's no fun in taming someone who's already tame. And what makes you think you really want someone who's tame anyways? There's no interest in that. Plus, when, when, when chaos manifests itself, what makes you think that someone tame is going to be good for anything? And it's a real question. And so that aggression is absolutely vital. It's absolutely necessary. But because it's inc incredibly dangerous, which of course it is, it has to be civilized. And so what happens is that the archetypal female in these pornographic romances seduces and tames the aggressive male. And that's her encounter 
with chaos. Now it's more, it's more comp. Of course, females they're more complicated, and that's exactly how it is, and it's no wonder because their their lives are more complicated. Jordan Peterson은 여성들의 성적 판타지에는 괴물이 주인공으로 등장한다고 말합니다. 우리는 지난 영상에서 이에 대해 자세히 다루었습니다. 남성의 공격성과 그것을 통제하고 길들이는 지혜로운 여성에 대해 이야기했었죠. 그건 괴물을 길들여 영웅으로 재탄생시키는 여성적 영웅 신화에 대한 환상이 깃들어 있기 때문이라고요. 그런데 괴물을 원하는 이유는 이것 때문만은 아닙니다. 괴물을 바라는 또 다른 이유는 우리 자신도 마음 안에 괴물을 품고 있기 때문입니다. Okay, so the first thing is you have to imagine it. Now people do this, so most people have erotic fantasies, and they spontaneously manifest themselves. And the more suppressed those are, by the way, the more extreme they become. So that's something to know. So you have an erotic fantasy, just like you might have a fantasy about making something to eat when you get hungry. You know, it's this biological system that's very deeply embedded within you, has some notions about how it might be gratified properly, and it sends up these little dreams that manifest themselves to you as fantasies. And those fantasies are, assuming they haven't been suppressed too badly and warped because of that, because you'd be lying to yourself, those fantasies tell you what you want and need, and you can communicate with that Dionysian spirit, and it will tell you what would keep you satisfied, or not just satisfied, how about thrilled out of your mind? That would even be better. And then you can admit that to yourself. In any case, you can reveal what your desires are to yourself. And that's a frightening thing because what sort of lust-ridden, god-awful monster are you? And the answer to that might be exactly the sort of lust-ridden, god-awful monster that your partner would actually like to make love with. That's a possibility. And then, you could say, well, I've got this fantasy and it looks like something that would be deeply satisfying if it could make itself manifest and it doesn't seem too perverse and short-term hedonic or destructive and so I could admit that to myself and then I could talk to my partner about it. And one of the things that's very interesting about short-term relationships is that people will do things with each other physically that they're too embarrassed to talk about and I, they won't discuss it. And I would say, well, that's an indication that you put the cart before the horse, man. If you can't talk about it before you do it, then the level of intimacy that you have with your partner is not proportionate to the level of intimacy that you're pursuing physically. And that's a disjuncture and a disharmony. And it's, it's suboptimal at the least, and it's really wrong. 결혼하지 않고 육체적 관계를 맺는 게 사람들은 성적인 자유라고 말하지만 꼭 그렇진 않습니다. 피터슨이 말했듯 짧은 육체적인 관계는 자기 내면의 충동과 주악한 욕망, 괴물을 드러내지 못하기 때문입니다. You know, telling the truth to someone is no simple thing because there's a bunch of things about all of us that are terrible and weak and reprehensible and shameful and all of those things and they kind of have to be brought out into the open and dealt with. And you're not going to tell the truth about yourself to someone who can run away screaming when you reveal who you are. And so the, the marriage bond is something like, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to handcuff myself to you and you're going to handcuff yourself to me. And then we're going to tell each other the truth and neither of us are going to get to run away. And so our, once we know the truth, then we're either going to live together in mutual torment or we're going to try to deal with that truth and straighten ourselves out and straighten ourselves out jointly. And that's going to make us, us more powerful and more resilient and deeper and wiser as we progress together through life. And, and I think that's absolutely brilliant because if you leave a back door open, man, you're going to use it. That's for sure. 이 그래프는 결혼적 성관계 파트너 수에 따른 이혼율의 차이를 보여주고 있습니다. 80년대, 90년대, 00년대 모두 일관적으로 파트너 수가 많을수록 이혼율이 높아지는 상관관계를 보이고 있습니다. 이 그래프는 결혼 전 파트너 수에 따른 행복도 조사인데요. 마찬가지로 파트너 수가 많을수록 행복도도 함께 낮아지는 것을 볼수 있습니다. 이런 결과가 나타나는 이유는. 결혼이라는 울타리 밖에서는 욕망을 추구하더라도 온전히 자기 자신의 괴물을 드러내지는 못하기 때문입니다. 즉, 자기 기만과 억압인 것이죠. 괴물을 드러내지 못하는 이유는 분명합니다. 남들 앞에 드러내기엔 너무나 추억하거든요. 그렇게 자신을 못 드러내기 때문에 깊은 관계를 맺지 못하고 원나잇을 하는 겁니다. 그런데 그런 태도로는 결혼해도 결국에는 대화가 안 되고 만족이 없죠. 그게 앞에서 보여드린 두 가지 결과로 이어집니다. 높은 이혼율과 낮은 행복도 말이죠. 
이런 인사이트와 함께 볼때 결혼과 그 안에서 형성되는 신뢰는 그런 의미가 있습니다. 자신을 온전히 드러내고 또 서로 이해받는 데서 비로소 발견할 수 있는 황홀한 기쁨 그거야말로 결혼이 제공하는 진짜 행복입니다. 자기 내면을 오롯이 드러나는 데서 오는 육체적인 쾌락을 뛰어넘는 영혼의 쾌락인 셈이죠. But with your marital partner, you can think, oh man, I'm stuck with you. Okay, so what are we going to do about that? Well, how about we investigate the nature of each other's fantasies and see if we can deliver what's requested. And let's see if we can make that into a game. And I have some practical advice for that. It's like, okay, I was a therapist for a long time and I talked to a lot of people about their marriages. I've been married 33 years as of two days ago and it's gone pretty damn well. And sometimes it's gone so well I can hardly believe that I'm privileged enough to be alive and have it happen. 말, 옳은 말이었습니다. 